So um, this is actually a picture of uh, my family's sailboat. So I just, I don't know why I put this in here, but maybe because, oh, I wanted to tell you that I come at this from a background myself. My father was, in a, in a way, a master navigator. That means he, he used a sextant to cross the oceans. He didn't use, like, GPSs and stuff. Um, and our radio only had a 24-mile radius. So he was a navigator, you know. Um, always hit his mark, too. He was really good. And uh, this is how I, I was homeschooled for my science projects on our boat. My dad used to make us navigate and see how close we could get to where he was going. We also conveniently lost our books overboard, which is always good. Um, <laughs> so this is the, the group of people that is helping us do this work, and I, I need to insert them in here. Um, Michelle Paddock here is a specialist on herbivory. Uh, Avigdor here is a specialist on marine restoration ecology. He's from the University of Tel Aviv. Giacomo, some of you know, my husband, he's a fish molecular biologist. And Peter Nelson is a fisheries science expert. And then we have Sarah Cannon, our undergraduate, and Kristen Prakota, who's here in the audience, um, is our, our statistician. So she does a lot of our data analysis uh, for us, which is very complicated for the kinds of data that we're getting, lots of it, and diverse types of data. So it takes a bunch of people to do this kind of work. And I want to point out here that when, when we were asked to come to help these people originally in the Outer Islands, the, my first instinct was, well, I had two first instincts. One, I can't do this alone because I'm not going to play conservation god here. I need a group of people to help me. And I need to talk to the people who live there. I don't want to tell them what to do. I need to talk to them. So here they are. And these are the people that have helped uh, make this uh, whole project possible. This is a junior up at the top, John Rolmall. And he's, um, I, I just came back from the Outer Islands just last week, and I can tell you this guy has relatives on every single one of them. <laughs> it's amazing. So what it taught me was how they create their relationships and their linkages, these people. They do it not only through blood relationships, but if there is a clan that does not have a relationship on a particular island, they will often create that relationship through adoptions. And an adoption will be considered as a blood relation after the adoption goes through. And it's very common to do adoptions. Um, down here on the bottom, we have Alex and, and Bosco and Mario. They're all from Ulithi. So they are the ones that are helping us collect the data out there. They're measuring the fish. They're sending us back data on the fish that they're catching so we can help inform them about the fishing. And <clears throat> I wanted them to come out with me so that they could tell the people what they're doing. I, I didn't want to be the one saying, this is what our project is all about. I wanted them to talk about it, because they're the ones that are doing it. And they're the ones that it's impacting the most. So they came, all of us uh, went together to the outer islands. And of course, uh, this work is not possible without communities. And so there's uh, all the people from the outer islands have really participated in this. And one of the things that was powerful for me was when Ike, the chief who made that, that quote that I just read earlier, and he said to me, you know, this project is great because, you know, we need fish. We're having trouble, everything. That's really great. Um, but one thing this is doing for us is it's uniting our people. And to me, that was very powerful because if they have been fragmented because of uh, technology and modern ways and things, they're fragmenting a bit, the people. And coming together around this problem, which is basically food for them, um, is, is becoming really important. And that's been very powerful for me. So, um, so where are we, where are we <laughs> anyway, in Yap? Where is this place? So Yap is south of Japan and uh, east of the Philippines. It's um, part of the Federated States of Micronesia. It's one of four states in the Federated States of Micronesia, which is an artificial designation of a nation. I'm here to tell you they are not really that similar, even in terms of their traditions and cultures, and certainly not in terms of their languages. Um, so uh, YAP, or the Federated States of Micronesia, are part of the Compact of Free Association. So this is a, a, an agreement. Actually, it's a, it's a compact that the Federated States of Micronesia and other, uh, region, other countries in the region signed as a result of World War II and the use of their territories for war. In return, they get technical assistance from the United States. And um, you can go Google what that means, and, and trust me, you'll be there the rest of your life, because I'm not quite sure what technical assistance means. But it comes in many different forms, including food in some cases. Um, they get to inherit our educational plan. Uh, so they teach, like, you know, US-based education in the Outer Islands. It's really quite funny, actually, um, and, and et cetera. So, and here's one really important point about this that I want to bring in here. These islands are autonomously governed. Some brilliant person managed to figure out they should put that in the legislation. So
So they are autonomously governed. Every single island has its own chiefs and councils and can make their own decisions. They do not need to wait for a larger entity to tell them what to do. So if they want to do management today, well, then they'll do it. And if they want to do it right now, they'll do it right now, which is really, really important for conservation, which often takes years to implement because governments have to decide and people have to discuss and it takes a long, long time. Here they can do it right now. So it, it can be very effective and is very effective. So here's um, the outer islands of Yap. And um, to the very far uh, left over here is a Yap proper. And Yap proper has about 38 square miles of land on it. All of these other outer islands, which stretch more than 500 miles as part of the Eastern Caroline Archipelago, they stretch 500 miles into the Western Pacific Ocean, covering more than 100,000 square miles of ocean real estate, autonomously governed by people who've lived there for a very long time in some of the most biodiverse waters on planet Earth. If that's not a conservation opportunity, I do not know what is. <laughs> and I can tell you that if we can enlist, and we are enlisting these people as partners in management and conservation, it's a very powerful example for the conservation community. So the rest of these islands only have about seven and a half square miles of land. So it's really water, it's a watery world, for sure, out there. So um, here's um, uh, our, our crew that went out to the Outer Islands, I'm just going to flip through some pictures here of the Outer Islands because we went on the supply ship. So here she is, the lovely Hatfield Mahal. <laughs> this was our friend for three and a half weeks. Uh, it was us and the rice and uh, some pigs and uh, some bananas and stuff like that on the half and a few rats, but you know, that goes, with, that goes without saying. So um, this is the state ship and when you get on the state ship, which supplies these Outer Islands um, with medicines, etc., does not run uh, very uh, much on schedule. So sometimes it goes every two months, sometimes once a year, sometimes every four months. It just depends on if it's working and you know, like that. So the people really can't rely on a scheduled uh, ship. So when you arrive on the ship, you need to find a place <laughs> to sit among all the stuff. Uh, OSHA regulations, um, I, I think, are sort of like forgotten in some of this. So here you see the skiff, um, and they're not done. So this, they're, we're still loading. We have about 20 more people here. <laughs> I, I'm telling you, those boats, they ride real low. So. Um, and it's a, a bit of a rough ride, so people sleep wherever they can, <laughs> except the babies. You know, they always love, like, moving boats and stuff. They just they have a great time. Um, but the adults uh, tend to have a bit of a rougher time. So here's uh, food on the Hapil Mahal. And this is part of the problem. I, I put this in here in part because this was the food and, uh, on the boat. So a lot of white bread. Um, Vienna wieners. You remember the last time you had a Vienna wiener? <laughs> uh, spam is a popular dining uh, item. And, um, and, un and semi-cooked bacon. Well, I mean like a half of a, of a thing of it each time. And then um, this was the only apple we had on the whole trip. And I don't know when it last saw its tree, but I think it was a really long time ago. <laughs> and uh, so this is part of the problem is the food that's shipped out to these islands is often white rice, white bread, and very fatty meats. And it's leading to some serious health problems in the people. Okay, but um, lucky for us, the Micronesians are some of the friendliest people on the planet, and they love to feed their friends, which basically is everybody. So luckily, there's lots of great food, fish, and taro, and banana, and breadfruit, and uh, we were able to get some good food to the people on the boat, because they, they're really wanting to share everything. Um, okay, there's the Hapil Mahal, um, I landed on one of the outer islands. So you can see that this boat creates some problems, too because the boat comes right up to the landing sites. It slams down a giant anchor. And well, you know, boats sometimes do things when they're at anchor. Anyway, we won't go there. But so all those things do cause problems when you have a small reef off of which you're fishing. And so we, we did have to actually discuss that. Um, so here's uh, some of the islands that, that uh, this is the islands of Ulithi Atoll. And here's the thing, is they're not just reefs, they're not just islands, there's people who live here. And those people have a whole lot of knowledge about their system. They know more about their fish than I could possibly know. They know more about their system and their fish and their islands than our entire team could possibly ever know. So enlisting their support in this has been really critical. A few pictures of how they live. They live very traditionally with the materials primarily that they get from their islands. This is the island of... Uh, a Europic right here. And um, they weave their own clothes. These are lava lavas, uh, which uh, the women wear. 
and they build canoes. And the farther out you get on the outer islands, the, the less uh, the motorboats becomes um, evident because they don't get fuel out there. Very difficult to get fuel. So they're still using traditional canoes in most of their fishing. This is also the land of the great master navigators. Many of you might know of the Hawaiian Voyaging Society and um, the Hokulua, the voyaging canoe that was built. Um, Mao was from Satawal, which is the farthest eastward of the um, islands, uh, of the Yap Islands. And Mao was a master navigator who was able to memorize the position of 120 stars at any given time in the night sky. And he could combine that map in his head with wind direction, with sea state, with animals that he would see, and he could know not where he was going, but he would always know where he had been. And by knowing where he had been, he would have an idea of where he was going. And, and people said, yeah, right, OK, whatever. You know? And uh, so he took this uh, knowledge. At age 18, actually, he was a master navigator. He took it to the Hawaiian Voyaging Society and successfully navigated the Hokulua from Hawaii to Tahiti. And it stunned the world. So I don't know how many of you remember this story, but it, it was in 1976 that he did this. And it stunned the world. And it made the world realize that navigation in these islands was actually possible. and that these people actually could go, amazingly enough, back and forth from island to island, and probably did originate from Asia, which people earlier than that said, there's just no way. I mean, they can't go against the prevailing winds. It's not going to work. So we know through now that actually it was possible. So the knowledge that exists in these people is tremendous. And I can tell you that in my interviews with them, and I've spent many hours interviewing and talking to people about fishing and fishing practices and fishing jurisdictions, it is unbelievably overwhelming. It's so much information, I can't possibly understand it all. So I pretty much give up after a while and, uh, and try just to share with them some uh, ideas that I have that might help them with their fishing. So we talked a bit about how diverse ecosystems are linked to diverse traditional practices. I'm going to show you a few of these. Here's one example. This is a, the ship that we were on was carrying two coffins. And um, these people have a very important relationship with their deceased. Um, one of which is they, they do a lot of touching, and you can see these women here are, are holding on to their coffin. And, uh, and it was amazing to watch that coffin be loaded onto the boats. The people never take their hands off of it. It's fascinating. This one's going to Fais, uh, which is an island where the deceased are buried actually in people's living areas. So they, they live with their living and their deceased. Um, but the important thing I wanted to point out with this story is that when a chief dies, usually areas of reef and also land are closed for a period of time. And that can be months, and it can be decades, depending on the chief and the jurisdiction of that chief. So this is, a peer, this is marine protected areas, right? I mean, come on, they're not going to call it that. And in fact, if you ask them, do you have conservation, they, they'll say, oh, what's that? No. But do they? Of course they do. Their traditions are intimately linked. They don't see it as a separate thing. So they don't see the way I live and conservation as two separate things, because they are completely linked together into the fabric of their culture, right? So these closures are a time for the reefs to recover, as well as for the people to reflect. And when we left the island of Lamotrek, the paramount chief passed away literally as we were leaving Lamotrek. And she was the last in her lineage of paramount chiefs, responsible for three islands and, and the associated islands in those atolls. She was extremely important. So as we were leaving, people were coming together to discuss what this was going to mean for them. Not whether they were going to do it, because that's part of their tradition. But for them, it was to mean, in her case, probably decades of closure of certain areas of reef, which was going to mean food hardships for them. And they were aware of that. So they were discussing how they were going to handle this. Um, this is a map of fishing jurisdictions, just to show you how crazy it can be. Okay, so here you see this island has one area over here, and then another over here. Um, this one has this big one over here, and then one over here randomly. Um, these islands have this giant one here. So it's really complicated, because a lot of fishing jurisdictions are also conservation-based. So certain clans will have responsibility for certain areas of reef based on not usually the size of the island, but who's in the clan. And sometimes, who gets access to one reef will depend on an event that might have happened. So for example, there was an event um, on this atoll where uh, somebody's son approached the daughter of a chief. Well, you know where that story is going, 
right? So, you know, not, not good. And as retribution or an apology really for that, they gave access to a really important fishing ground forever to that community. So they don't do things by punishment. They do things by apology. It's kind of interesting. So here's just some pictures of different fishing techniques. They garden clams. So this is a picture of Sa on Satawa where they're gardening these clams. And uh, these are giant clams. So they'll get them together in their in, uh, lagoons and, and nurture them and garden them. They use fish traps. And depending on the type of reef, a different type of trap. Depending on how deep the water, a different type of trap. They use spear guns, which is this picture on the left. These are um, homemade spear guns. And I'm going to tell you this story here in just a second about spear guns, because this has been part of the problem. They also use hook and line. And they also use nets of different kinds, so different size mesh, depending on the time of year, depending on the habitat they're fishing. So it's extremely diverse. Um, here's a cool net that we watched them use. Uh, this one, they use the leaves that you see to beat the water. And the leaves will make a noise underwater. And then people will push the fish into this net. And this net is used for community fishing only. So a family can't take this out and just like go catch fish today. It has to be the whole community. And all the fish are then distributed throughout the community. Um, here are turtle uh, spears. So yes, they do eat sea turtles. And part of the work we're doing out there is with a woman named Jennifer Cruz. And she's doing sea turtle conservation work with these people. Um, so, you know, there's the charismatic megafauna again. Everybody goes, ah, no, not the sea turtles, right? Um, but this is part of their food and has been for many, many years. And they have a whole lot of traditions, customs, and taboos around sea turtles and, and ways uh, not to overfish them. For example, you're not allowed to catch the female as she's emerging from the water. You have to wait until she comes back. Why? Because well, then she's already laid her eggs, right? So they won't necessarily know why those traditions are, but those traditions are conservation-based, right? And they have certain times of year they're allowed to catch turtles, which is around their nesting, or not, not during the peak of the nesting season, but just following it. So all of these practices help to keep the reefs diverse, um, which is kind of the message there. And here's just some pictures of what happens after they do the catch. And I can tell you, this was, I was super hungry for this stuff, because after the spam, this is really, really good. Yeah. So clams, they pickle the clams in vinegar. And the vinegar they get from the flower of the coconut tree. So the, the flower of the coconut produces a nectar. And they actually have a, a little siphon they stick into the flower. And the nectar drips into a catchment container. And if you get it in the morning, it's called a sweet tuba. So it can be used to make syrup. It's delicious. Leave it until the end of the day, and then it becomes a pretty potent tuba wine, um, which the, the men in particular partake in. And if you let the wine sit longer, it makes a vinegar with which you can pickle your clams. And then um, here's turtle meat. So this was a part of our diet as well on this trip. It tasted a lot better than spam, for sure. Um, so these communities are changing, right? So I'm not advocating. I'm not advocating for taking communities and people and taking them back to the way it was right before contact, because everything was so good back then. I'm not advocating for that. It's not reasonable, it's not prudent, and it's not fair. But there is a way to go forward by using their traditional practices, along with science, to support management. Okay, so their, their traditions are changing. I'm going to show you some pictures here of World War II. I'm going to uh, go through these kind of quickly because they're, they're kind of cool. 